What's cracking YouTube? Welcome back to Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. As always, it's your boy Nick. And we are wrapping up the AFC West today. Team Outlook, the Oakland Raiders. The Raiders. They're not the Las Vegas Raiders yet, right? Technically going to be considered the Las Vegas Raiders next year. Regardless, this is the last of the four AFC West teams. Team Outlook Tuesday, we dropped the Chargers this morning. The Raiders now, so go check that out or go check out the other teams if you haven't yet. If you're looking for any specific team or player, just go to my YouTube channel, type in the search bar that team. Within that team's outlook, you'll have any fantasy relevant player and my thoughts on that player for the year. Today should be good. The Raiders have a fully stacked lineup, a real nice offense. Offense, a lot of fantasy weapons to work with. We got Beast Mode Bike. Remember, if you enjoy the video, if you found it informational, valuable, whatever, whatever, go give it that thumbs up. Time to take some notes. So when you think Raiders, besides psycho fans and their costumes, think of Derek Carr. Or at least in recent years. Carr signed that fat, fat deal this offseason. Five years, $125 million contract, $40 million guaranteed. So they told Carr, you're our guy. You're going to lead our franchise for the next five years. Does he have it in him? I think so. Last year, he left week 16 with a broken fibula, six to eight week recovery table, completely fine for this year. He'll be thrown behind the NFL's top ranked pass blocking line. He was among any quarterback with more than 12 games played, 12 games started, he had the least number of sacks, 16. He barely got pressured. There was barely pressure on him. From weeks one through 16 before he broke his, his fibby, he was quarterback nine in fantasy, threw for three or more passing touchdowns in 33% of the games. He would have had even better numbers, but he broke his pinky finger in week 12. Once that happened in week 12, we saw his completion percentage from week 12 on drop from 66.4% all the way down to 55.5. So some bad injury luck last year, hurt Carr, hurt his overall numbers. He probably would have finished in that top eight quarterback range for fantasy. Now he'll be at full health. He's got a full set of weapons. We got an emerging Amari Cooper as a superstar, you know, Michael Crabtree, old and reliable back. They brought in Jared Cook as a nice pass catching weapon at the tight end position. Also brought in Cordell Patterson, who's a nice versatile weapon for him. Not a great receiver or anything, but he, he adds a dynamic to the offense, which, you know, opens things up for defenses. So right now he's getting picked as quarterback 10, about 101st overall. I think that's about right. I think he finishes somewhere between quarterback eight and quarterback like 14. That whole middle tier of quarterbacks is, you know, it's kind of uh, pulling hairs there, but I would take a guy like Kirk Cousins or Cam Newton who are going right around the same spots. Before Carr, we just haven't really seen the whole yardage production really get up there yet. The potential is absolutely there. If he, if he stepped up and went top five this year, I wouldn't be completely surprised by it. So when we move over to the weapons, the same debate that we've had for the last few years, the last few off seasons, Mari Cooper, Michael Crabtree, who is the play? It's as prevalent this summer as it was last summer. Cooper, the ultra talented, young, up and coming superstar. Do you want Crabtree? Old, reliable, always eats up targets, always eats up receptions, year over year consistency. You can get both. You look over the last couple of years, right? Crabtree kind of edged out Cooper in fantasy production. Both standard and PPR leagues, he, he's beat Amari out in each of the last two years. But Cooper is stupid young, right? He just turned 23, has back-to-back -back years of 1,000 receiving yards on his resume. 23 years old, 1,000 yards in his rookie season, 1,000 yards in his sophomore season. That jump is coming, people. Sorry, just moving this over a little bit. I say yeah, I say hells yeah, but you will have to pay the price for it. Right now he's going off the board 18th overall, wide receiver nine. So you're gonna be using your second round pick on Cooper if you want him on your team. Now I've explained in depth, if you watched my top three bold prediction video, which I will link right here, you should go check that out. I went in depth on Cooper and why I said as a bold prediction, he's gonna be the number one overall fantasy wide receiver this year. You look back at his rookie year and his sophomore year, he dipped. His performance dipped pretty greatly over the second half of the season, in, in both seasons. And I went in depth on why. I mean, the rookie year, I would say it was a lot of a stamina thing. He also was dealing with a plantar fasciitis over the second half of the year, which obviously is going to play a major role in it. When you look back at last year, you look at his first half of the season, right? Weeks one through eight. He was PPR fantasies wide receiver three top three wide receiver he had four separate games of 125 plus receiving yards in that eight game span 
He was averaging almost 18 PPR fantasy points a game. Now, you look at the second half of the season. He did not reach 100 receiving yards in a single game over the next eight games. But here's what I say to that. He only had a healthy car for two of those eight games, right? Weeks one through eight, phenomenal. Week nine and week 11, he had a, he had a week 10 bye. Week nine and week 11, he had two solid games against Houston and against the Denver Broncos, two very good pass defenses. He still put up 27 and a half PPR fantasy points combined between those two games. He led the team in receiving yards during those two games. So it wasn't like he fell off or anything during those games with Carr healthy. He just didn't produce like top five PPR numbers. Then, like I said, week nine played, week 10 by, week 11 played well. Week 12 is where Carr broke his finger. And like I said, Carr's completion percentage dipped almost by 10% once he broke his finger for the rest of the way. When you break your finger on your throwing hand, that's gonna greatly affect your deep ball. And Cooper, obviously, being the guy on that team, Crabtree's not the deep threat, he's the possession receiver. Cooper is the one that was affected by that broken pinky. You know how hard it is to throw an accurate 40-yard bomb down the field with a broken finger? I have no idea, I'm, I'm asking you, to be honest with you. Those deep shots are where Cooper eats. Over the last few years, I can't tell you how many times I've seen Carr target Cooper on a long ball and it just grazed his fingertips. Or, or he was a centimeter out of bounds. There's just nothing that's really broken right for him, and I feel like this is the year that it will. That thing you saw at Alabama where he just take games over. Defensive backs better know that he's really taking it serious, that he's trying to go attack them this year. He's not going to let them come to him. That's Carr on Cooper this year. Obviously, he's been an animal throughout practice. And I was working on my, uh, my rankings yesterday, and I actually moved Cooper ahead of Doug Baldwin. So after uh, that first, that second tier of wide receivers, Cooper is my next guy up. So it's like Cooper ahead of Baldwin, ahead of Des Bryant, ahead of D Hop, Brandon Cooks, probably ahead of T.Y. Hilton, depending on if we get any more Andrew Luck news coming out soon or not. But like I said, I love Cooper. I think he this is the year that he finally takes that giant step. So what do you do with Michael Crabtree? As per usual, you take him at a great value. People will get burned by this every year. They don't want to take him because he doesn't have that high ceiling, but his floor is incredible. Right? He's 29 years old. He's not particularly young, but just saying he's old at 29 is not a valid argument not to take him. When you're 29, you still have a few years left in you to really utilize your body and put up good numbers. Over the last couple of years, he's outproduced Amari Cooper, the young gun, the young, the young runner in standard and PPR, and he's easily Derek Carr's favorite possession receiver, possession target. He's had 285 total targets over the last two years. That's over 140 on average, and he's I think he's had like 142 and 143. So still, the exact, you know what you're getting from Crabtree. So the floor, the floor is just gorgeous there. And don't forget, Crabtree was a former first round pick for the Niners back in the day. It just didn't pan out there. Sometimes you need a change of scenery, and that's exactly what happened when he came over to the Raiders. He was a top talent. He was a top 10 pick in the NFL draft. You want to talk about consistency when it comes to Crabtree. Crabtree had at least 85 receiving yards and or a touchdown in 11 of his 16 games last season. He has highest yards per reception since 2013, 11.3 yards per catch. So nothing to me there says that Crabtree's lost a step or he's going to take a step back. So even if, you know, Cooper takes control of that wide receiver one spot and really jumps up in target total, maybe they swap target numbers. They're the league's seventh highest scoring offense. They put up 26 points a game. If, if you subtract the week 17 game where Carr wasn't even their quarterback, it would be 27.3 points per game and they'd probably be, I think, like top five or top three, right? So Crabtree provides so much value as a wide receiver too in a really high scoring offense because, you know, he routinely sees the second string cornerback. If he's running routes over the middle, maybe it's a linebacker or a slot guy. Cooper is always up against the top cornerback on the other team. So I would be perfectly fine having both of them on my team. Crabtree's going 46th overall, wide receiver 23. So you get him in the fifth round, which is ridiculous. But behind those two, you have Seth Roberts, who's basically been the Oakland's number three wide out for the last couple of years. Finishing fantasies wide receiver 56 and 69, respectively, 2015, 2016. So he'll be battling Cordell Patterson, like I said, new signed free agent for, you know, snaps, targets, that wide receiver three spot. You know, given his size, Cordell Patterson, he's like 6'4". It's possible he carves out like a goal line roll, one of those like fades because, you know, Cooper hasn't seen too much success in the red zone and in the uh, inside the 10. Oh yeah, and I wanna, I wanna touch on that too before we move forward from Cooper and Crabtree. I understand that um, Crabtree and Cooper, you know, in terms of red zone targets is, is pretty disparaged, but when you look at targets inside the 10 yard line, there was a good uh, study or an article written previously that basically shows that targets from 
inside the 10 are the only targets that really matter when you're talking about like red zone targets, they call it the 10 zone now. So if you're getting targets, like if you're gonna use an argument where saying he gets this many red zone targets, if it's from the 10 to the 20 yard line, those are not anywhere near as valuable as getting targets from the 10 in. So when I look at these numbers, I look at that, right? Well, Crabtree out-targeted Cooper 21 to 13 in the red zone. He only out-targeted him eight to seven inside the 10. So he's still looking, so Carr's still looking at Cooper inside the 10. It's just the fact that Cooper caught zero of those seven targets inside the 10 yard line. You could look at that and say, maybe Cooper's not good in the tight spaces. Maybe he just can't produce those touchdowns when he's down there. Or you could look at it and say, okay, that's plenty of opportunity for him to grow and him to score more touchdowns, right? Caught zero of seven targets inside the 10. I would say, you know, at worst, that number goes up to like two. That's an extra two touchdowns to add to his stats. I know it's not like a great argument, but it makes sense. So when you're, when you're arguing Crabtree versus Cooper and you're gonna say things like, oh, look at his red zone targets, those targets outside of the 10 yard line really don't matter. They're the same thing as getting targeted at like the 50 yard line for an eight yard pass. But back to what I was saying. Uh, Coral Patterson, yes, he could carve out a goal line role. You look back at his rookie season when he kind of had that role. He scored three of four 10 zone targets, converted those into touchdowns, but I, neither of them are gonna be viable options in redraft leagues in my opinion. So we move on to tight ends. We have Jared Cook. Turned down a big offer from Green Bay. Cook played really well down the stretch from 2016, so he's got some momentum going into this season, right? He, he's 30 years old, but over the last six games with the Packers last year, including the playoffs, he averaged over five receptions, 68 receiving yards, and he scored twice in their final two playoff games. So, you know, the Raiders have struggled to get any kind of production out of this position, out of the tight end role. And there's always someone that's hyped up, whether it's Michael Rivera, whether it's Clive Walford or something like that. But I think Jared Cook's actually the best option that they've had here in a while. So I think he can carve out a, a, a pretty good uh, pass catching role. Right now he's going off the board at like tight end 25. So he's almost guaranteed to return value on that pick. I don't really see him cracking like the top 14. I, I could see him finishing as like tight end 15 or 16, but Cook is definitely someone to keep an eye on. If, you know, it, it, say you take like a, a Gronk or an Eifert and you're late in the draft and you need a backup tight end, Cook's not the worst option. So we move to beast mode. Beast mode, beast mode. All right, I spend a lot of time talking about beast mode already. I did a. I did a whole video he signed with the Raiders, which I will also link right here. You should go watch that. That was probably whenever he actually signed. I think that was like a month ago, two months ago. So some of the some of the info might be out of date. But what I was saying is basically I love Beast Mode this year in the position that he's in, right? Right now he's going off the board 38th overall, RB15. But his ADP continues to rise. And I'm sure it will continue to rise as more drafts, you know, as more real drafts come to fruition. And I've actually seen him go as early as pick 18 in a, in a play draft league that I was in, which is way, 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 way too early for me, given that he doesn't have a lot of receiving upside. And of course, you know, it's just risky him not playing football for two years. But I would say is, I've seen some videos of him this preseason. He looks good running. He's gonna be running behind a great offensive line. He easily has that 10 to 12 touchdown upside. If Latavius Murray can do it, Beast Mode can do it. And I know I heard, I saw the report that just came out about how Latavius Murray's 200 carries or 195 carries from a year ago should suffice for Beast Mode this year, if not less than that, if the other two running backs can earn more work. I wanna break down that statement for anyone that takes that shit seriously right here. First of all, that's just Roto World because they're not high in Marshawn Lynch, so they're gonna use every kind of blurb that comes out to twist it and make you not want Marshawn Lynch and be like, oh wow, Roto World was on top of that. But here's, you know, that report came from a guy that works at the San Jose Mercury News. If you're gonna base your opinion on a player from a, a, a newspaper like that, you're a fool. I went back, this is how, <laughs> this is how pissed I was. I went back, I, I went to the article that, that Roto World sourced it, and I went to the author that wrote it, scrolled back to last off season, and I wanted to see what kind of predictions he had going into 2016. Is this guy for real? Does he know what he's talking about? These are a few of the quotes that he had. Amari Cooper is going to eat next season, talking about 2016, don't rule out 1,500 yards, uh, and he has over 100 catch potential. 
Sounds to me just like lazy reporting on all for this Marshawn Lynch thing, for Amari Cooper. He also said about Clive Walford, has the skill to be a major weapon. If healthy, he will thrive in this offense with Derek Carr. So he just, it sounds like he's, first of all, dramatic when he's reporting this shit, and he's just kind of lazy and just throwing out numbers. Cooper, 1,500-yard season, 100 catch potential. Marshawn Lynch, yeah, 200 yards should be fine, as long as, uh, even less if the other backs can uh, carve out more work. Like, it's just a dumb statement because any running back could lose work if the guys behind him carve out a bigger role. Like, the same could be said for any running back. So I'm taking that with not even a grain of salt. I'm taking that with 17 tablespoons of salt. And like I said in the beast mode video, even if Marshawn gets 200 carries, right? Like Latavius Murray did. Latavius Murray was a top 11, top 13 running back in fantasy with those limited carries. And he only averaged four yards per carry. So my thing is, with the opportunity that Lynch should see, especially on the goal line, he really has the double digit touchdown upside is like almost not even as upside it's, it's it's like probably a smart projection for 9 to 11 touchdowns so that's how I, that's where I stand on Marshall Lynch but back to his uh, backups you have DeAndre Washington Jalen Richard right they're gonna fight for scraps they're gonna be the second now guys and not scraps they're, they're gonna be a, a decent part of this offense both backs were rookies last season and both of them posted very promising rookie years DeAndre Washington averaged 5.4 yards per carry Jalen Richard 5.9 yards per carry opposed to Latavius Murray's 4.0 yards per carry behind the exact same line I don't think either of them are gonna be able to carve out enough of a role that they make a huge impact this year because the Lynch signing, but both are definitely very promising NFL prospects. You have DeAndre Washington going off the board about 180th overall, 50, and then you have Jalen Richard, 220 overall, RB 57. The thing about owning either of these guys is there's no true handcuff there. So if something happens to the 31 year old Lynch, comes to injury, you're not going to be confident saying that like DeAndre Washington is going to be the fully featured back or Jalen Richard is. So that's my thing with like with handcuffing Lynch. You're going to waste two picks on guys that are not even the full workhorse load. So if I had to choose one, it would definitely be DeAndre Washington. I think if Lynch goes down, I think both of them hold RB2, RB3 upside because they should see 12 to 15 touches a piece. I think DeAndre Washington is a better pass catcher, a better all-around athlete and would fit the role a lot better because he was... Uh, a, a workhorse, a three down back in college. And they'll be running behind this this offensive line, which is incredible. And that's it. I, th I think in best ball formats, they have some value. I think in dynasty leagues, they definitely have value because who knows how long Lynch is going to last in the league. At most two years, at worst, he gets hurt this year and, and one of them takes over. He signed a two-year deal. He could be set through for two years, but either way, I, I, we'll see how it works out this year. I'm, I'm higher on Marshawn than I guess a lot of people are, but you know, if you can get him as your RB2, he has such high touchdown upside. So that's that. That wraps up the video. That wraps up the AFC West. We'll be coming back at you on Thursday, another Team Outlook Thursday, and we will begin the AFC South, I believe. So we'll start off with probably the Texans and uh, another team in that division, whatever, whatever, whatever. As always, I'd like to leave you with a question. So straight up, who would you rather take? Marshawn Lynch, Leonard Fournette, Isaiah Crowell, 0.5 PPR. Marshawn Lynch obviously has the highest touchdown upside because the team's a lot better overall, but the other two likely get a bigger workload. But I want to hear your 0.5 PPR, Lynch, Fournette, Isaiah Crowell, straight up, and why. So go follow me on Twitter. Go uh, make sure you give it the thumbs up, the video, and subscribe to the newsletter on the blog and all that yada, yada, yada. <laughs>